Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Liz Porter, the interim Tony Remby Dean of the University of Washington School of Law. And I want to welcome you to the 2022 commencement exercises. I'd like to begin our ceremony with a land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands with the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I am honored to join you in this a moment of celebration of your many accomplishments. This year, we are recognizing about 280 graduates from more than 30 countries. I am also so thrilled to welcome you to our first in-person ceremony in three years. This year, more than many other years, we feel the true significance of your accomplishment in graduating from UW Law. You have courageously pursued your legal education in the face of illness, Zoom, <laughs> the erosion of constitutional norms, the rise of racism, the death of Justice Ginsburg and major shifts on the Supreme Court, gun violence, and, exemplified by today, a record-breaking quantity of rain. You have gained new and powerful ways of understanding the world, and you have, despite isolation and stress, made deep friendships and shared joy. Today, as we celebrate in person, I hope that you understand that the clouds in the sky cannot cloud the joy of this moment when we come together to recognize your work and watch as you step over the threshold into your lives as lawyers, advocates, judges, and policymakers. During other years, at other commencements, speakers and deans will say something like, we're counting on you to transform the world. This year, during this time, that sentiment feels weightier, more immediate, more real than ever. No matter what you do with your UW Law degree, you are charged going forward with promoting and defending the Constitution equity, and the rule of law. This is true wherever you choose to live and whatever type of law you choose to practice. In an airplane, when there's a medical emergency, the flight crew will call for a doctor or nurse to assist. The person who steps forward may be a midwife, a radiologist, or a research doctor who studies cancer. But in an emergency, all of them stand ready to return to the core of their identities as healers and caretakers. The same is true for you. Whether you become a public defender or a mergers and acquisitions lawyer, whether you practice family law or whether you use your master's of jurisprudence degree as a policymaker, you all share the same obligation to stand up for due process, fair and open elections, and equality under the law. You too are healers and caretakers. And in an emergency, you are called on to return to this core of your identity. Where in other years, this might be an abstract concept, a discussion of values or ideals, it does not feel that way this year when we are surrounded by emergencies. That is why when I say that we're counting on you, I really mean it. We need your skills, your dedication to justice, your resilience, your laughter, and your anger to help us protect the norms of equality and justice that should be at the core of our constitutional democracy here in the United States, and in seeking fair and accountable governance in other nations throughout the world. The stakes are quite high, but we have watched you. We've watched you master complex legal doctrines, fight for curricular or legal reform, represent clients, protest against racism, and take on impactful leadership roles, both in the law school and outside of it. We know you can do it because you already have been doing it. In closing, please remember that you are not alone in taking on the responsibilities of this profession. Your faculty, your fellow students, UW Law alumni, and other law graduates all over the state and nation share this obligation. On behalf of the faculty, as your teachers and mentors, 
as the people you sometimes complained to and sometimes complained about. Let me say that we are honored to have spent the past three years with you, whether in person or on Zoom. And we welcome you to the legal community as our colleagues. Thank you. Before moving on with the program, I just want to also take a moment once again to acknowledge the families and friends who have shown up to support your graduates. During a time when all of us needed as much encouragement as possible, your support allowed our students to persevere and thrive. Turning inward to the law school, I want to begin tonight by thanking the faculty, law librarians, and staff. You've worked tirelessly. <laughs> Though I know you were in fact very tired. To help the law school and our students achieve their professional goals during the uncertainty and trauma of the past few years. I also want to take a moment to recognize a few members of the UW Law community. Professors Anna Mastriani and Kathleen McGinnis and law librarians Mary Wisner and Peggy Jarrett will be retiring at this ac the end of this academic career. They have had amazing careers and contributed enormously to the success of the law school. We're grateful for all that you've done and we look forward to you continuing to be involved with us even after you've left us full time. I also want to thank a colleague who has served our school as a member of the leadership team. Professor Zahra Saeed has completed her term as Associate Dean of Research and Faculty Development. Her creativity and energy have been essential to the intellectual life of the law school during this difficult time. Graduates, as we celebrate today, we are excited to share many messages of support in marking this milestone. You're going to hear from several speakers, including Professor Angelica Chazaro, student speakers, <laughs> student speakers Christian Santana, representing the JV program. and Bethany Al-Haidari, representing the graduate programs. <laughs> Finally, we are very lucky to be able to hear from UW Regent and UW Law alum, Blaine Tamaki. I hope their remarks will be a reminder that you are part of a tight-knit, dynamic community that believes in you and your success. Commencement does not change our relationship you remain a part of us. Now, I am pleased to recognize the Student Dean's Medalist for 2022. This is a special recognition for a combination of academic excellence and overall contributions to student life. This year, the awards go to Allison Johnson and Kenneth Nelson. Allie Johnson is a native Seattleite who received her undergraduate degree in communications from UCLA. While here at the law school, Allie served as the, an executive managing editor on the Law Review and as co-president of the Women's Law Caucus. She also worked as a Hazleton Fellow for Professor Lisa Mannheim and a law clerk for the Complex Litigation Division of the Washington Office of the Attorney General. After graduating, she'll be clerking for the Honorable Judge Robert Lasnik of the U.S. District Court in the Western District of Washington before joining the firm of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher in Los Angeles. Ken Nelson is a Filipino immigrant who grew up in Bremerton, Washington. He graduated from the University of Washington and is a first generation college graduate. Here at UW Law, Ken served as a board member for the Asian Pacific American Law Student Association and co-founded the First Generation Law Student Association. He also served on the Washington State Minority and Justice Commission. As editor-in-chief of the Washington Law Review, he planned a symposium on the restatement of the law of American Indians. After graduating, Ken will practice at the law firm of Perkins Coie here in Seattle. Allie and Ken are just two of our outstanding graduates this year. In the back of the commencement program are the names of other graduating students recognized for their academic and leadership achievements, including the editorial boards of our four journals, Moot Court, and, and clinical advocates, pro bono honorees, and students with extraordinary records in service and scholarship in all of our programs. Congratulations to all of you. Yeah. 
Now, I would like to welcome Professor Chazaro to deliver her faculty address. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. I want to start by thanking the staff who did the work of setting up this area for us to celebrate commencement and who will clean up after we are done here. I also want to start by saying congratulations, class of 2022. I am proud of you and all you have overcome to sit here now and claim your legal degrees. None of you did this alone. I thank the families and communities you came from who delivered you to us and carried you through, many of whom are by your side to support and celebrate you today. I hope you are able to stay present and grounded in the beauty of this particular moment, even as we cannot fully separate ourselves from the realities beyond this patch of wet grass on the University of Washington campus. In fact, it's precisely because of these external realities that I invite you to take in the joy of this day when you are surrounded by people who love you and wish you well and are proud of you and all you have become and will become. The past years have tested us all and have dug deep wells of grief for many of us, wells that on days like this fill with rejoicing that is that much sweeter. We turn towards each other because, as James Baldwin reminds us, the moment we cease to hold each other, the moment we break faith with each other, the sea engulfs us and the light goes out. While around you the light threatened to go out, you managed to complete your legal degrees. You transitioned on and off and on and off Zoom classrooms, splitting your focus between the screen in front of you and the pandemic raging around you. Even as you dug into legal precedent, you saw officials taking unprecedented actions in response to the pandemic, pausing student loan payments, halting evictions, switching to remote schooling and remote workplaces. What was previously deemed impossible was suddenly the only logical solution. Yet you also witnessed mass death, with one million dying of COVID-19 in this country alone. People were left to die in crowded cages, in jails, prisons, and immigrant detention centers. Essential workers made our work and study life possible remotely, even as they were denied the basic protective equipment to safeguard their own lives. Police officers murdered Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, yet stood by as school children in Texas were shot. 100 years after the Tulsa massacre, White mob violence reared its head once again, this time at the U.S. Capitol, at the urging of an outgoing head of state. Human activity continued to accelerate species loss, and even as we celebrate today, dozens of species will go extinct. To some, the world appears to be in a downward spiral. But ask yourself, who benefits from you believing and acting as if this downward spiral is inevitable? If you didn't know it before, you know it now. In the world unfolding before us, precedent will only get us so far. I hope the events of the last few years have instilled a healthy disrespect for precedent that will serve you in confronting the unprecedented challenges ahead. I hope that even as we welcome you to the legal profession, you find a way to reunite fully with the communities you come from and with the commitments that brought you to law school to begin with. Because class might be dismissed, but you are not excused. You are not free to stop learning and thinking and imagining something different. You are not free to stop acting, to stop resisting, to stop dismantling, to stop building. As you claim your degrees, I invite you to step more fully into your humanity, more fully into a commitment to each other's survival. We are not locked into any given outcome. Precisely because we don't know what happens next, you are free to act, secure in the knowledge that in the words of David Graeber, the ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something that we make and could just as easily make differently. While you were in law school, everyday people came together and made Seattle the only city in the country to defund the police two years in a row. 
the racial justice uprising in the summer of 2020 was a rupture. Millions of ordinary people rushed into the streets, including many of you, to demand a future free of policing and full of mutual care, a future where black communities, where queer and trans people, where disabled people experience true public safety for the first time. As lawyers, you will be invited to resolve ruptures like this one in favor of the status quo. And so I urge you now, do not become apologists for a social order predicated on the death and disposability of millions of living beings. Do not become keepers of the myths that have the U.S. committing to 38% of the world's total military spending. Do not uphold a criminal legal system that stomachs black people being 13% of the U.S. population, but nearly 40% of the people in jails and prisons. Turn towards each other. Turn towards your communities and swear allegiance not to ossified institutions, but to our collective survival. Swear allegiance not to norms of respectability and civility, but to the disruptive experimentation needed if we are to dismantle the institutions that created the crises we face. Your legal degree is a tool. Figure out how to be on tap for the fights to come instead of becoming a defender of the current state of affairs. As Audre Lorde reminded us, change did not begin with you and it will not end with you. But what you do with your life is an absolutely vital part of that chain. The testimony of your daily living is the missing remnant in the fabric of our future. Choose to be awakened by what has transpired during your legal education and commit to action that leaves no one behind because none of us are safe until all of us are safe. I will be rooting for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, everyone. You know, when I first heard I was nominated by some of my peers to speak before you all, I laughed. I thought the honor should so clearly go to someone who thrived in law school, someone who easily made Order of the Quaff, not someone who had been mispronouncing it Order of the Queef for the past three years. <laughs> or perhaps someone who secured a job months ago, or a clerkship perhaps, not someone who until very recently was looking for employment. Fun employed, as a good friend of mine calls it. But it took all of 20 seconds to remember that probably everyone graduating today has had mad imposter syndrome. After all, we're graduating in the midst of a global pandemic, y'all. Law school wasn't just miserable and seemingly impossible for me. That was the case for all of my friends and for every single graduate before me. Well, I shouldn't generalize. To the two or three of you out there who enjoyed law school, I'm sorry, the speech may not resonate with you as much. <laughs> because this speech is dedicated to all of us who struggled with the exorbitant amount of readings and assignments every night. And on top, oh my god, sorry. And on top of that was the expectation to take on all of those extracurriculars, find the perfect summer internship, externship, clinic work, and so forth. This speech is dedicated to those of us who seriously contemplated dropping out. To, to peers who, like me, had a breakdown or two or 10 in the law school library. Those of us who were just starting to get into the rhythm of law school when a heartbreaking illness called the coronavirus forced us all into remote law school. Friends and family, law school can be an incredibly isolating experience. The pandemic only served to further isolate us from the few people who understood all the BS we were going through. The speech is dedicated to everyone who kept their cameras off during Zoom law school. <laughs> too overwhelmed by the millions of other things going on in our personal lives and around the world, but who still manage to log on to Zoom every single day. Finally, this speech goes out to every single one of us who questioned what our role as future attorneys are in a system that is fundamentally broken. To my peers who came to advocate for their communities, only to learn that our primary role is to uphold a system that was made by white, wealthy, landowning men for white, wealthy, landowning men. This speech is going somewhere, by the way. I promise I'm not just rehashing all of our collective traumas and hardship for funsies. There's a point to all of this, but more on that later. 
Because law school wasn't all just pain and suffering. I wouldn't be here standing before you if that was the case. Going to law school gave me the tools to navigate an unjust legal system, tools that I do hope I can bring back to my communities. But outside of skills such as learning all the legal procedures, the blue book citations, all the legal jargon designed to gatekeep these resources to the privileged few who can afford them, I gained one particularly powerful tool, how to advocate. I fully learned the scope of this particular skill during my first year of law school. It was a monumental moment for me, and I'd like to share it with you all, my graduating class. During our first year, we were all navigating such difficult circumstances. Though it feels like a lifetime ago, I'm sure we can all remember what that felt like. Anxieties about our torts and civil procedures exams quickly became anxieties about our torts, civil procedure exams, and the coronavirus. As if things weren't bad enough, we also had to witness and come to terms with the horrors of a systemically violent police force concentrated specifically amongst black, fam black communities. And this doesn't even begin to cover the personal issues and struggles we all went through. Though we don't know the specifics outside of our close circles, I don't think I'm alone when I say it felt like everyone was going through something at this time. On my end, I was navigating ending a relationship that I now understand was emotionally and financially abusive, corrupting my experience of first love while stealing thousands of dollars in the process. I felt a lot of things, folks. Heartbreak, confusion, anger. But I also felt, I remember feeling a resounding sense of injustice that I knew I had to do something about. I wrote a demand letter, sent via certified mail, of course. <laughs> and when that went ignored, I eventually filed a suit in small claims court. As difficult as that all was, I remember knowing what service of process was and how to compile all my evidence to formulate a coherent argument for myself. I'll spare you guys all the details, but we ended up settling out of court and, spoiler alert, I got most of my money back. <laughs> the reason I share all of this with you today is because this was the first time that I didn't just stand up for myself. I advocated and I fought for myself. At the time, I thought it was a sweet little bonus that I learned how to do this through law school. But looking back, that wasn't just a small lesson. It was the most important lesson. One that I think we're all gonna need to practice more of, myself included. Because remember earlier in the speech when I talked about how awful law school was? Well, it isn't unique to UW Law, and it isn't an accident either. The institution of law and its profession is designed to overwork us as law students so they can overwork us as attorneys. It doesn't matter if you're going into public interest, big law, criminal defense, whatever the case may be. We're all expected to give everything we have at the cost of our relationships and our mental health. In fact, the best advice I've ever received came from UW, UW Law alumni Varsha Govindaraju. When asked about managing work-life balance, she acknowledged it was not easy, especially for us incoming attorneys. There's always one more thing to do, and the pressure to do the most you can is very real. However, when that clock hits 5 p.m. and you want to do your next task, ask yourself, is what I'm about to do going to fundamentally change the life of one or more of my clients? Directly impact the life of one or more of my clients? If the answer is yes, then fine. Stay the extra time and finish the work. But more often than not, I think we'll find that I can wait until the next work day and we won't need to sacrifice our mental health in the process. <laughs> Class of 22, we are so much more than just law students and soon to be attorneys. We're sons, daughters, children, spouses and partners, friends. Some of us are artists, hikers, dancers, coffee enthusiasts, dog and cat parents, even human parents, and so much more. <laughs> there were times in law school when I forgot or neglected these identities. I don't want that to happen in my career as well. If there's one thing I want to emphasize for you all, it's not to forget that and to advocate for yourself, first and foremost. I'd like, to, I'd like to end my time by thanking and acknowledging all the people who made UW Law not only bearable, but in some cases extraordinary. Starting off with our staff and faculty. Thank you all so much for those of you who genuinely cared about us, who prioritized our health and well-being over upholding the norms of a backwards, antiquated legal system. There's way too many of you to name, but just to highlight a few. Professor Mary Fan, thank you for being you. 
Not only did you prepare us for the profession by deftly teaching us the concepts of criminal law and procedure, but you also highlighted and acknowledged what some of us know far too personally, that the law is not applied equally and is too often done so through the color of our skin. Professor Anita Ramasastri, one of the most accomplished yet humble faculty members on campus. Your contracts class was so well taught, I still find myself reading every agreement for my sign, asking if there was proper consideration. You know, for fun. Although, I guess you weren't perfect, Professor. I do remember that you had to miss a day or two of class. To fly over to DC and do your work as a member of the United Nations Working Group on Business and Human Rights. You know, no big deal. But in all seriousness, thank you for your instruction and most importantly, your care. I don't know if you know this, but a group of us endearingly called you Mama Sastri, a testament to the compassionate professor that you are. But if there's one professor that I had to highlight, that would have to be the iconic Kimberly Ambrose, <laughs> whose race and justice clinic does not receive one tenth the accolade it deserves. Can we please give her a round of applause, everybody? In a two year that was defined by Zoom, unrest, and uncertainty, thank you for reminding me why I came to law school and wanted to become an attorney. I have nothing but love and appreciation for you, Kim. I'd like to thank everyone who supported us for the past three years, who stood by us through every arduous step of the way. To our friends, to our families, both chosen and biological, thank you. También le quiero dar gracias a mi familia que vino desde California para estar aquí. Es por todos sus esfuerzos que, está, que estoy aquí, que estamos aquí dando este discurso juntos. Gracias a todos, especialmente a mis papás. A mamá y papá, todo lo bueno en mi vida ha sido en parte gracias a su amor y su apoyo. Gracias. Last and certainly not least, I'd like to thank you all, my fellow classmates. I won't lie and say we all got along perfectly. In fact, it, at times it felt like we were back in high school, except full of people in their 20s and 30s, which surprisingly wasn't all that, di that different from high school as teenagers. But jokes aside, we all went through this insane, stressful, hybrid, in-person, remote journey together. And because of that, as we enter the legal profession, I know we'll have each other's backs. And for that, I am eternally grateful. To, the, to my graduating class, I'll leave you with one final quote. Legendary drag queen RuPaul famously says, if you can't love yourself, how in the hell are you gonna love somebody else? And to that, I say, yes, queen. <laughs> and, and I challenge us, class of 22, to push this one step further. If you can't advocate for yourself, how in the hell are you gonna advocate for somebody else? It's only when we pour our passions, skills, and talents into ourselves our health and well-being before we can fully do so for the clients that we hope to serve. And you know, despite our differences, there is at least one thing that unites us all, whether or not we enjoyed law school. We just graduated from the University of Washington School of Law, and that's pretty badass. Congratulations to the class of 2022. We did it, y'all. <laughs> You guys can stay standing, that's fine. <laughs> um, I appreciate that Christian was surprised to have been selected by his classmates to speak. I, on the other hand, specifically targeted and lobbied my classmates to ensure that I'd be standing here today, so thank you. <laughs> um, we often forget um, that freedom of speech isn't something that is a recognized right worldwide, so having the right to speak in general means something profound to me now. I am so grateful to be standing here today, not only at the end of this journey through law school with my incredible colleagues, our professors, and the staff that makes UW Law thrive, but here in the United States and in a democracy and legal system that while far from perfect, at least considers me a full human being under the law with the right to speak and criticize the system we live in. This wasn't the case for me just two years ago as I was stuck in Saudi Arabia, facing a 
arrest warrant, a 10-year travel ban, and being stripped of my parental rights to the child that I effectively raised as a single mom simply because of my identity and beliefs. The law can be dehumanizing and enraging and beyond simple imposter syndrome, which I do have, I also appreciate the fact that it is against all odds that I'm standing here today to celebrate with you. For perspective, can I ask that every woman here raises her hand? Look around you. The word and testimony of every one of these hands raised in the jurisdiction I was navigating through is considered half a man's. Under male guardianship laws, these raised hands would require their father's permission to marry or to get access to other basic rights. If they were married, laws under the kafala or sponsorship system would require them to get their husband's permission to exit the country, to work, to open a bank account, to exit jail, to access medical help, and disobedience to their husband, by the way, would still be criminal under the law. Law can be enraging. You can also imagine how this may play out for victims of domestic violence, of human trafficking, abuse, rape, and other violations. Laws aren't always about justice. Often, even here, they can be part of a system of repression designed to keep certain people in power. I never planned to go into law. To be quite honest, I thought lawyers were mostly corrupt and boring people who were more a part of the problem than the solution. And while that may still be true for some, on my journey, I experienced firsthand that in most major crises, it's only lawyers who actually hold the tangible keys to achieving justice. What brought me to law school was anger. And hear me out, because we do come from a culture that overemphasizes positivity and has a history of glossing over pain and justice and telling us not to be angry, but just to get over it. I disagree. Anger has a unique transformative power to create long overdue and necessary change. In 2010, for example, I was working in Tunisia as a teacher, and I witnessed the start of the Arab Spring as Tunisians took to the street, calling for the fall of a dictatorship and basic rights for all. The shared anger and pain of injustice mobilized people, and it was strong enough to topple a dictator. Inspired by what I saw, I moved from teaching to human rights work. That took me to Saudi Arabia in 2011. At the time, women were not permitted to study law, so I approached my studies on Saudi law via academia. Over the years, I watched as acquaintances, colleagues, journalists, friends, and heroes of the human rights movement in Saudi were detained, disappeared, tortured, and even killed all for things such as driving while female or calling for equal rights for women, for starting civil society organizations, or for calling for a representative, representative government, or even for simple critical tweets. For these crimes, these heroes were charged as spies, traitors, and terrorists under the law. Eventually, it wouldn't be only my Saudi colleagues who were impacted by repressive laws, it would impact me as well. The importance of the demands of women's rights activists sitting in prison would come to play in my own life. The New York Times broke our story in March of 2019, and my life was condensed into a headline that read, American woman, divorced from Saudi husband, trapped in Saudi Arabia. It was embarrassing. It took me years to muster up the courage to leave an abusive situation, and I found myself sitting in a courtroom, forced to cover from head to toe in black, facing criminal charges and allegations on my fitness to parent because I wasn't a good enough Muslim. I was foreign. I had ADHD. I did yoga. I wore a bikini. I worked full time, and I was against the government. And these were legitimate grounds to challenge the right to parent my child. On July 14th of 2019, I fell to the ground sobbing as a judge ruled to strip me of parental rights to my then four-year-old girl. The court reasoned that I was foreign and the child needed to be protected from my culture. I later found out, without being served, without notice, without right to being heard, that the government had issue issued a 10-year travel ban on me from exiting the country, along with an arrest warrant. The end date for that travel ban was August of 2029. My heroes and colleagues were being detained, tortured, and killed. We were silenced. I felt that I had no rights under the law, and I was unable to protect myself or my child, and facing losing the only thing that I was living for at the time, my baby. In my darkest hour, I struggled with hopelessness, depression, wanting to give up, and feeling like I would be stuck forever with no way out. But that didn't happen. 
Instead, people got angry. Lawyers in the United States fought in U.S. courts to get evidence. Lawyers in Saudi Arabia put together my appeal. International human rights lawyers submitted my case to the UN. Members of Congress rallied for us and the Washington State Legislature changed laws for us. In moments of complete darkness, it was lawyers and legislators who held the key to our freedom. The pressure worked, but in the context of a lawless and hyper-patriarchal system, all legal efforts were derailed and I was forced to reconcile, placed right back in the arms of the person I was trying to be protected from and for months, I had to put on the greatest and most degrading act of my life. Pretending to love someone in hopes that he would one day grant us permission to exit the country, a power that the law extended to him on the sole basis of being a man. But it eventually worked, and on December 15th of 2019, we got on an airplane. I left my company, my home, all my money, all our possessions apart from one suitcase and my little girl. And no money or possession in the world is more valuable than living with dignity and the freedom to speak and basic rights. I felt like I was holding my breath the entire trip, but I'll never forget the moment when I looked outside the airplane window as my daughter was asleep next to me and the clouds cleared to reveal the space needle as we were landing. I started sobbing. As I remember, it was the first time in years I felt safe, fully human, and equal under the law. I sobbed so hard, in fact, that the Department of Homeland Security found me to be suspicious and pulled me over and off the fight for questioning. <laughs> At any rate, Washington State, because of the people, because of our community, because of lawmakers, eventually became a haven of justice for me. We were supposed to return to Saudi Arabia, but Washington's courts extended emergency jurisdiction over us and eventually refused to enforce Saudi orders for our return on human rights grounds. The court minutes noted that if I had to return to Saudi, I would be, quote, subject to imprisonment and possibly death. I'm still fighting to stay here today as it's on appeal now, but major shout out to my team at Perkins Coie, some of who are here today, who took that appeal on pro bono, thank you. But every moment here is a gift, especially today. And with our time here and thanks to an incredible community, I've had the opportunity to take that anger, that fear and that pain and channel it into hope and action. Law school has been a big part of understanding that process. We all have stories and reasons for being here. My story was once an embarrassing news headline and felt like a suffocating injustice, but that story gave me the tools, the empathy, and the understanding which led me to be a better advocate for human rights and justice for others. I now have the honor to work with the Freedom Initiative in DC, working directly with families fighting for freedom for their loved ones who've been wrongfully detained in Saudi. I also work with the Human Rights Foundation where I lead on cases trying to get justice and accountability for victims of human trafficking without lawyers, without people who are angry about injustice. I wouldn't be standing here with you today finishing law school or doing any of this work and this is where you all come in. We, as law students, have been equipped with the tools and the right education to make meaningful changes to the system, and that is an enormous responsibility. My lawyers, my elected representatives, the judge presiding over my case here, they were not just lawyers, representatives, or judges. They have been my lifeline. As future lawyers, legislators, or judges, you have the opportunity not only to change lives, but hear me clearly, to save lives. You may also have the opportunity to be seated on the wrong side of a case or to oppress someone else. And I urge you not to use this opportunity that you've been gifted to contribute to any more pain and suffering. I've been so inspired by the resilience of my classmates here. We have lawyers who fled authoritarianism, lawyers who are fighting to be rejoined with their family after war. We have classmates who've been fighting for immigration reform, classmates fighting racism that's intrinsic in our legal system. We are an incredible group, and I am so optimistic for the future knowing all of you. Today is a happy day, we made it, but I urge you, class of 2022, especially as we carry the responsibility of law, please do not allow yourself to become numb to injustice. Be angry when it's merited, and please channel that anger into hope and community action to make the changes long overdue to the system that we are going out to be a part of. I wouldn't be in law school without the inspiration of Saudis who equally fought repression in the system that they were a part of and for it paid the ultimate price. So I dedicate today to those who could not be here because of their views. To Jamal Khashoggi, Dr. Abdullah Al-Hamid, Lujain Al-Hadlul, Aziz Al-Yusuf, Salah Al-Haydar, Muhammad Al-Qahtani, and Abdul Rahman Al-Sadhan. Thank you. Congratulations.
Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Bethany. We will now recognize candidates for the degrees offered by the University of Washington School of Law. Thank you, Dean Porter. My name is Mike Townsend. I'm a faculty member at the law school, and I'm also the faculty director of the PhD program. Dean Porter, faculty, graduates, family, friends, honored guests, I am pleased to announce that there are three recipients of the Doctor of Philosophy degree in the class of 2022. The PhD is the highest academic degree offered by an American university. It is awarded only after significant coursework and the production of a dissertation that represents a novel and significant contribution to the discipline in the view of a reviewing committee of scholars from that field. There's a special recognition for PhD graduates. It's a tradition in the United States. We read out the title of the dissertation after announcing the name of the student. This is, in essence, a public announcement of the qualifications of that student to join our community of scholars. Then we hood the recipient, and that is symbolic of a welcoming of that candidate into the community of scholars. The three recipients are as follows. Dr. Qichen Ching, dissertation is entitled, Governing Information Privacy, Understanding How the Federal Trade Commission Regulates Privacy. Jane Wynn was the chair. Unfortunately, Dr. Ching cannot be here today but I assume he's either watching now, I hope, or will be watching soon. So I'd like to lead a round of applause for Dr. Chin. Our second candidate is Dr. Aristo Pingari Buen. The dissertation is entitled, Cooperation and Non-Cooperation in Indonesian Criminal Case Processing ego skeletal in action. Anna Bosch, the chair. She will join me in hooding Dr. Eric. Congratulations. Dr. Pangari Buan. Our third recipient is Dr. Najud Abdul Razak Bafarat. <laughs> Dissertation entitled The Relationship Between Business Facilitating Legal Institutions and Foreign Direct Investment in the Arab Gulf States. Professor Thomas Schoenbaum was the chair. <laughs> Dean Porter. I present our three recipients. Oh, my name is William Covington. I'm Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and I also direct the Public, the public Policy and Technology Law Clinic. I, along with uh, my colleagues, Dean Anna Inter, Dean of Students, 
and Terry Price, Executive Director of the Graduate Programs, will present to Dean Porter our JD candidates for the class of 2022. If the candidates would come forward. It is my great pleasure to present our first JD candidate, Christian Santana. Jennifer, Jennifer Ann Henderson. Jasmine Chigbrow. Aaron Buraded Samuel Yared. <laughs> Daniel Walter Ballesteros, Jr. <laughs> Matt Narotsky. Xander Haight. Oh, oh. Jacob Rose. Christian Brennan Moran. Gabriella Ayala Montgomery. Martina Alea Bahore. Marcina Nichelle Day. Isaac Castaneda. Alexandra. Lukanshu Rolaila. Erica Pru. Congratulations. Laura Kirk. Congratulations. Ivy Pham. Congratulations. Vincent Lee. Catherine Obermiller. Congratulations. Christine Sivis. Jessica Lundberg. Congratulations. Mana. Nina Mesbawe. Allison Buljano. 
Michelle Hannah Hughes Hoagie. Emma Bergen Hosio. Lucy Bauer. Savannah Jane Torborg. Thank you. Allie Johnson. Thank you. Tess Raven. Jessica Ann Letterman. Scott Lanayas. Carly Zipper. Sabin Moon Medler. Michelle Brown. Jessica Cable. Ariana Nord. Emily Parker. Cameron Cantrell. Nicole Hope Buckley. Zoe Wood. <laughs> Tallman Trask the Fourth. Yumang Jihon. Yerin Yun. Jemima Waithira Kamau. Alicia Renee Shotland. David Eduel Dryberg. Warren Pugash. Connor James Mannix. Sasha Scalbania. Emma Johnson. Charles Van Dyne. Nathan Edward Wolf. Abra Franco. Caitlin Lloyd. <laughs> Owen Taylor. Evan Yeager. Alexandra Egan. James D. Kernan. Torki Khalid Almohazen. Did you want 
Lindsay Makalalid. Bradley Shepard. Dane Anderson. Nathaniel Post. Tyler Weaver. Alec Dugan. Lauren Mamagani. Joanna Elizabeth Mersich. Mason DeForest Fletcher. KT Wynn. Caroline Alyssa Sung. Celeste Ajay. Kayla Auliiani Ganier. Richard Kim. Kenneth Nelson. Xavier Gardner. Grace Channing, Grace Byleon Reeves. Young Sun Park. Woo! Clara Vierden. Woo! Jess Burton. Woo! Laura Peak. Camille Walther. Woo! Maya Ita. Gabriel Robson Villarreal. <laughs> Jacinda May Carson. Tay Chung. Tay Chung. Tay Chung. <laughs> Christine Nicole McFadden. <laughs> Kay Fullman. Bridget Connor Schiff. Thomas Correa Kaplan. Micah Cassidy Moosebeer. Melanie Cray. Gregory Lanton. Christina Rodriguez Rico. Jay Calloway. Wendy S. Martinez Hurtado. Lynn Chung. Benjamin Pardue. Joshua Max Cargill Bly. Brock Thomas Stone. Oliver Batkoff. Jake Henke. Alexander J. DeRoche. John Francis Connolly. Daniel Holly. Mustafa Hassoun. Dante Tyler. Moses Gabriel Marikov.
Jacqueline Tunney. <laughs> Isabel M. Skilton. <laughs> Molly Utter. <laughs> Sarah Cooper. <laughs> Madison Welsh. Tyleen Kramer. <laughs> Bo Dylan Bryan. <laughs> William Platner. <laughs> Kelsey Cloud. <laughs> Alexander Copeland. Sydney Alexandra Johnson. <laughs> Isabel Anino. <laughs> Mason Hudon. <laughs> Catherine Joy. <laughs> Marissa Nicole Forth. Rachel Elizabeth Hay. <laughs> Melissa Janine London. <laughs> Hannah Louise Benson. <laughs> Samantha Elizabeth Murray. <laughs> Cassandra Aaron Baker. <laughs> Isabel Mularki. <laughs> Paige Victoria Galliardi. <laughs> Dylan Deschamps. <laughs> Joshua Hughes. Paula Bizier. <laughs> Nasreen Maria Chaudhry. <laughs> Olivia Ritchie. <laughs> Hannah Talmadge. <laughs> Alex Arntz. Megan Leonard. Emily Lewis. Adriana Line. Catherine Eve Hardiman. Dean Porter, that concludes the JD presentation of degrees. Professor Vygrotsky. Dean Porter, faculty, staff, students, honored guests. It is my privilege to start introducing recipients for um, some of our graduate programs. We have seven LLM programs. We also have a Master of Jurisprudence program. And it is my privilege and honor to introduce the recipients of first, the Asian and Comparative LLM program, followed by the General LLM program. Please, graduates. Graduating from the Asian and Comparative LLM program, Fang Chen Yu. Yeah. 
<laughs> and graduating from the general LLM program, Bethany Al-Hadari. Can we hug you? Yes. Congratulations. Anna Marie Shorman. Juhi Anil Deep. <laughs> Alyssa Coates. <laughs> Laya Medheven. <laughs> Ling Zhuang. <laughs> Mariska Poli. Ching Huan Wang Jack Ko Kung Jose Angel Arias Angulo Mohamed Adel Bona. <laughs> Dean Porter, that concludes the graduates from the Asian and Comparative LLM and the General LLM programs. Dean Porter, I'm pleased to present the graduates for the Global Business LLM program. Mohamed Arif Ashakzai. Tamar Zadigin. Michelle Small. Rabia Paracha. Monica Tatiana Ruiz Tovar. Gloria Lete Domingos. Mariana Di Carvalho Bacu Williams. <laughs> Hemashri Subramanian. <laughs> Michael Aaron Klausler. <laughs> Dean Part of that concludes the, the graduates from the Global Business LLM. I am now pleased to present the graduates from the Health Law LLM, Jeremy H. Conklin. <laughs> Olena Bedenko Zvarichuk. <laughs> Osevwe Eno Sampson. Dean Porter, that concludes the recipients of the Health Law LLM program. I'm back. Dean Porter, it is my honor to introduce the recipients of the LLM degree in intellectual law and policy. Hello, hello. Congratulations. Amara Fong Sarpang. Yeah. <laughs> Shu Yi Li. Thank you. Congratulations. Xiao Li. Isha S. Andige. Ridi Tulshian. Aaron D. Weissman. <laughs> Victoria Guzman. <laughs> Yuyang Wang.
The importer, that concludes the recipients of the LLM degree in intellectual law and property. Dean Porter, it is my honor and privilege to present and recognize the graduates of the Master of Laws in Sustainable International Development. Allison Wade Bradley. Erendira Nahomi Ramos Vasquez. Lisa Noonan. <laughs> Twisha. Eddie Mrembe. <laughs> Julio! <laughs> Maggie Kandiga. <laughs> Michelle Eichleman. <laughs> Rhoda Adeke. Bridget Fisher. <laughs> Yulia Kovalchuk. <laughs> Nira Hasarom. Yes, Hasarom. Saisani Munsatan. Ah, and last but not least, Isaac Sankara. I would also like to recognize three of the Sustainable International Development LLM graduates who also received their JD degrees. Please uh, stand when I read or say your name. Tylene Kramer. Jemima Kamu. and Molly Utter. <laughs> Dean Porter, that concludes the recognition of the Sustainable International Development Class of 2022. <laughs> Dean Porter, I'm pleased to present the 2022 graduates from the Tax LLM program. Sumit Karbanda. Hannah Lee. <laughs> Aneta Stefaniak. <laughs> Mikhail Horba. <laughs> Mengyu Chi. Dean Porter, I also want to recognize three JD students who also received a concurrent Master of Laws in Taxation. Please stand when, to be congratulated when I announce your name. Joshua Max Cargill Blay. <laughs> Tess Rabin. <laughs> and Han Shun. That concludes the 2020 Master of Taxation graduates. My name is Patricia Kuzler, and I direct our Masters of Jurisprudence program. Our MJ program is designed for non-lawyers who seek a deeper knowledge of the law to recognize and respond to legal issues in a vast array of professional settings. It is our most diverse and our largest program. Uh, Dean Porter, uh, I am pleased to present our uh, candidates for Masters of Jurisprudence. Oops. Lashina Taft. 
<laughs> Sarah Friesen. <laughs> Hannah Colasar. <laughs> Cheryl Brady. <laughs> Emily Jacobson. Gina B. Rice. <laughs> Alexis Nicole Christine Grigsby. Jean Carlson. Rachel Last. <laughs> Alexander Lopez. <laughs> Kadrin Mullen. Darren Kumar. Alexander G. Zamora. Yuang Zhe Zhang. Yang Yuan. Shufan Lao. Uh, Chen Shen. <laughs> Kejian Zhang. And Jin Rei Zhao. Uh, congratulations to all the candidates and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I present them to you, Dean Porter. <laughs> now we will hear from our distinguished alumni and University of Washington Regent, Blaine Tamaki. There's not going to be any raining on this parade. <laughs> My name is Blaine Tamaki, and I graduated from the UW Law School in 1982. I'd like to thank interim Tony Remby Dean, Elizabeth Porter, for this special invitation to speak today. It is truly one of the biggest honors of my life to be able to celebrate this special day with all of you. Thank you, Dean Porter. Graduates, I would like you to remember when you received your actual notification that you were accepted into the UW Law School. Do you remember that warm feeling? Wow, I did it. My hard work finally paid off. And then the most important feeling, maybe this is my big break to achieve my dreams and maybe I can make a real difference in this world. Sadly, especially for our JD students, your law school journey then immediately descended into chaos as you were faced with a global pandemic or for LLM, MJ and PhD students, perhaps you started law school just as our school was coming back together. But for all of you, everything normal and expected was no longer normal and expected. No one prepared you that law school would be online learning or would require wearing a mask. No one prepared you that your journey would be haunted by the prospect of deadly disease if you step within six feet of the next person. 
Finally, no one prepared you that loneliness, isolation, and fear would be one of your closest buddies through your law school journey. Law school is difficult and the ultimate challenge under the best of circumstances. But under the worst of circumstances, parents, family, and friends, think about it. The guts and the drive it took for your loved one to finish one of the most difficult races in their life all amid a once-in-a-century devastating pandemic. But the one cool thing, the one constant that has not changed at all since your letter of acceptance is this. It's your own bright future. Graduates, look around. What path will you choose from here? Many of you will focus on paying off your big school loans. You will use your knowledge and skills to preserve the integrity of capitalism, advance global and local trade and commerce. You will advise, guide, and help, help businesses succeed. You will pursue the American dream for you and your family. That's the expected path to choose, especially when faced with huge debt, family commitments, and our drive to succeed in life. Yes, indeed, I initially chose this path, especially, and it was quite the change for me, the person who wanted to help the poor before law school. Others of you, will directly buck the status quo and devote your life to battle for social justice. And I applaud you for your choice. Who else will protect our voting rights? Who else will protect our privacy rights and a woman's right to choose? Who else will create public policy to reduce mass shootings? Who else will give voice to the marginalized, the vulnerable, the injured, the damned, and the poor? Who else will protect our environment and slow down climate change? Who else will remember that black lives matter, that Asian hate is wrong, that indigenous people have especially been wronged, and that discrimination against the LGBTQ plus community is just legally and morally wrong? But regardless of your chosen path, I ask you to remember this. Your generation is the best generation ever because of your inclusive values, sense of justice, and ideals. You have a special commitment to the health of our planet that no prior generation has ever seen. You have witnessed hate an exclusion from my generation, and, a, and you have yelled at the top of your lungs, enough, stop, enough. One of the happiest moments in my life was when I too received my letter of acceptance to UW Law. I felt I had something to prove in law school since I was a direct product of affirmative action. Back in my day, affirmative action included Asians and Japanese Americans. And just so you have all the facts, my own Japanese American father was sent to internment camp for three years during World War II, despite being a full American citizen. It made me understand that race and ethnic origin does matter in America, and it matters a lot. I didn't enjoy law school. I was burned out by my second year. And let me share you a few memories as to why. During my first year, 
when I questioned one law school professor about my low grade, he said, son, what was your LSAT score? I told him, despite my thinking, what does that matter? He replied, son, you should be proud of your C grade. You are a class C racehorse trying to race against class A thoroughbreds. Later that year, I was actually named outstanding oralist of the first year moot court competition. Yet I was not invited to join the moot court honor board for my second year. In my eyes, I had been wronged, but what was worse is I was completely silent about it all. Despite my graduation from, from UW Law, I received no Seattle job offers, which had been my top goal after graduation. I had only one job offer back in Yakima, my conservative hometown, and it was as a business lawyer. I worked long hours generating billable hours. I was always first to work and I was always last to leave. But I felt lost, I felt like a misfit, I felt like a loner. My politics did not match anywhere. But finally, I had the guts to start my own practice in Yakima as a plaintiff's trial lawyer 12 long years into my career, fighting for the poor, fighting for social justice, my original path. I found my voice finally, and I haven't been silent since. Thank you. Today, I am 65 years old, and yes, my politics still don't match because I still reside in Yakima. But now, it's by my choice. If you're wondering, graduates, how my story might apply to you, I want to share with you today that I proudly sit as the chair of the Board of Regents for the entire UW system, the highest governing body of the University of Washington. This makes me the UW president's actual boss. In addition, I was the lead lawyer in a landmark case against the Jesuit order representing hundreds of tribal children, now adults, who were systematically sexually abused as children in Indian residential boarding schools owned and operated by the Jesuits. We eventually collected hundreds of millions of dollars for the survivors and forced the Jesuit order into bankruptcy. We then pursued and successfully resolved and continue to pursue similar cases all over the United States on behalf of the indigenous survivors. For that work, I won the Trial Lawyer of the Year from the Washington State Trial Lawyers Association, now known as the Washington State Association for Justice. Graduates like me, you will eventually come full circle. You will forgive your own dysfunctional upbringing, if any, at UW Law. And you will grow to respect and love the womb from which you were born. Even more, you will want to give back and help others who follow in your footsteps. For me, this meant funding diversity scholarships and mental health services at the UW Law School. And why should you also give back to UW Law when you are able to help those who will follow you? That's a simple moral to my own story. 
help those who follow you. It's part of coming full circle and it's part of finding your own voice. In closing, thank you for this honor. And on behalf of the entire UW community, we applaud your wonderful achievement, your courage, and your triumph over adversity. As the last and final commencement speaker tonight, let me repeat, as the last and final <laughs> commencement speaker tonight, I'd like to uh, acknowledge two special guests. My uh, son and daughter are here tonight. I appreciate your coming. And I'd like to acknowledge a fellow regent, Leo Fuller. Thank you for coming today too. You are now all law dogs for life. It's a bond we will share for eternity together. Now humor me. Since this is a graduation, one time all together now, I want all the graduates and everyone here to yell, Go Law Dogs! One, two, three. Go Law Dogs! <laughs> everyone, have fun tonight and be safe. Thank you. Graduates, hi, how's it going, Ken? Okay. Sorry. Oh, I think we thought we'd see you again.